this morning we will be in Acts chapter 9, and we're going to go ahead and look at verses, the first 25 verses of that, um, of that chapter there. So Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 25, and the title of the message this morning is, um, is thank you uh, for the cross. Thank you for the cross. So before we actually get into the study, let me go ahead and pray one more time, and then uh, we'll look at the word uh, together. Well, Lord, once again, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this time, Lord, that we've gathered here to worship you, to praise you. And now as we get into your word this morning, Lord, we pray that you would open up our minds and our hearts, Lord, that your word would land a good soil and take root in our lives and in our hearts, Lord. We thank you so much, Lord, for just everything that you're doing in our lives and continue to do in our lives. And this morning, as we get into your word, Lord, we ask that you would speak to us. I pray that um, you would use me, Lord, this morning, that I would decrease and that you would increase and that you would just speak the words that you desire to speak, Lord. Fill this place with your Holy Spirit. We thank you so much for this time once again. We pray these things, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so this morning as we gather and as we get into another week, as we prepare for um, Thanksgiving, you know, everyone thinks about food, right? Everyone thinks about turkey. Everyone thinks about the, the side dishes and, and maybe even the desserts. And maybe in your house, there's a tradition where maybe everyone has a chance to say maybe one thing that they're thankful for, for the year. And as believers, when people ask us what we are most thankful for, you know, what do we usually tell them? Uh, I think maybe we're quick to say, like, it's our health, it's our families, it's our friends, it's this or it's that. And often we forget to neglect the fact that we are extremely thankful for our life in Jesus Christ. And the greatest blessing we have is a life in Jesus Christ. And that's something that we should be the most thankful for. not, Not just on Thanksgiving, but every single day of our lives. Because remember, in Christ, all of us that have given our lives to the Lord have been made new. And in fact, the Apostle Paul speaks of this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. There he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see the new has come. And this past Sunday, I was really reminded of the fact that we should be really thankful for our life in Jesus Christ. As I was teaching the youth back, back here last Sunday, As you guys know, in the youth group, we've been going through the book of Acts. And uh, last week, we were actually in Acts chapter 9. And it really just reminded me of how grateful I am for what the Lord has done and continues to do in my own personal life. And this is something that we want to share with everyone. And often on days like Thanksgiving, that's a great opportunity to be with family and to be with friends and relatives that maybe we haven't seen in a while and maybe have maybe gone astray or maybe don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it gives us that opportunity to live a life that represents the Lord. And you, you think about what the Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, our lives are these living letters of recommendation um, for the faith. So people are reading us, people are seeing us, and that gives us an opportunity to share the love of Jesus Christ with everyone around us. So this morning, as we look in Acts chapter 9, we look into the life of Saul of Tarsus. What we're going to see is this dramatic change in his life and in his plans. One of the greatest events in the history of the church is what we're going to see here. His road to Damascus, his way to Damascus, and how that changed him. And in Acts chapter 9, this is actually his first account of this event. If you look in Acts chapter 22 and Acts chapter 26, it also speaks um, of this particular account in his life. And what we're going to see is this individual, a terrorist who is persecuting um, the early church, is turned into one of the greatest apostles that would ever live. A conversion that was only possible, possible because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. For him, for us, and for all who will ever believe. And nothing is too hard for the Lord. He's amazing. The Lord is amazing. Sometimes we put him in a little box, but the Lord does things that are just beyond us. And for all of us that have given our life um, to the Lord, all of us have our own story. All of us have our own Damascus road, if you want to call it that. And the Lord has changed our lives from a life of bondage to sin 
to a life in freedom in, in Jesus Christ. And as we reflect on the cross this morning and the impact that it has had in our own individual lives, it certainly gives us a heart of, of thanksgiving. So this morning, before we actually look at the text, verse by verse, I'm going to go ahead and read um, the entire text. It's, it's 25 verses. It's not Psalm 119. So we'll go through it, and then we'll look at it verse by verse. So beginning in verse 1 of chapter 9 of the book of Acts, um, here Luke declares for us, or documents for us, Now Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and, and requested letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any men or women who belonged to the way, he might bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he traveled and was nearing Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul said. I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting, he replied. But get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the sound, but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they took him by the hand and led him into Damascus. He was unable to see for three days and did not eat or drink. There was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, here I am, Lord, he replied. Get up and go to the street called Straight. The Lord said to him, to the house of Judas, and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. Since he is praying there in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and placing his hands on him so that he may regain his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard from many people about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has authority here from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for this man is, a cho is my chosen instrument to take my name to Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Ananias went and entered the house. He placed his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road you were traveling, has sent me so that you, you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. At once, something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul was with the disciples in Damascus for some time. Immediately, he began proclaiming Jesus in the synagogues. He is the Son of God. All who heard him were astounded and said, Isn't this the man in Jerusalem who was causing havoc for those who called on this name and came here for the purpose of taking them as prisoners to the chief priests? But Saul grew stronger and kept confounding the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had passed, the Jews conspired to kill him, but Saul learned of their plot. So they were watching the gates day and night, intending to kill him, but his disciples took him by night and lowered him in a large basket through an opening in the wall. Amen. All right. So this morning, as we have read here in, in Acts chapter 9, there are several things we're going to see in this initial life, in this initial plan of Saul of Tarsus. So the first thing we're going to talk about is actually in the first two verses. And what we see here is Saul's initial lifestyle, his initial plan of, of terror. So in verse 1 and 2, it says, Now Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and requested letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any men or women who belonged to the way, we might bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So here we have this initial description of his plan of, of terror. And if you look in the book of Acts, chapter 8, in verse 3, it says there, Saul, however, 
was ravaging the church. He would enter house after house, drag off men and women, and put them in prison. Now, if you look in the New King James Version of this account, it says there that he was wreaking havoc. Okay, and that word havoc, if you look that up in the original Greek language, is lumino. And that means to affix a stigma, to dishonor, spot, defile, to treat shamefully, or with injury, to ravage, to devastate, and to ruin. And in fact, if you look in the book of Philippians, or the letter to the Philippians in chapter 3, verse 6, later Paul even acknowledges his zeal for persecuting the early church. So when you think about this, this guy wasn't just persecuting the early church, he was terrorizing the early church. This guy was a terrorist. And it says here that he was um, after those that belonged to the way, the men and the women. So this term of the way, what does this mean? Well, this is a term that was used to describe early Christians from the early church. And in fact, if you think, for example, like in the Gospel of John, for example, it tells us there that Jesus is the truth, right? The way, the truth, and the life. And if you remember there in that 14th chapter, you know, the Lord was there. He was reassuring the disciples as they had much reason to be troubled, right? He already had told them, hey, one of you is going to be a traitor. You know, all of you are going to deny me. And he was going to leave them that night, right? Um, And he told them there in John chapter 14, verse 1, he tells them, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, what I have told you, that I am going to prepare a place for you. If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you may, also, you may be also. You know the way to where I am going. Lord, Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will also know my father. For now on, you, you do know him and have seen him. So once again, that term of the way is referring to those early Christians and, and the Lord, of course, referring to it or referencing it here in the Gospel of John. If you look in chapter 19, chapter 22, and chapter 23 of here in the book of Acts, it's also used there as a reference uh, to individuals that belong to the early church, early Christians uh, there in that time. And these were the individuals that Saul was after. These, were, these individuals were his prey. And if you could imagine, if we were there in that time in the early church, he would be after us as well. And I love how Wearsby puts this. He says, maybe in the mind of Saul, he thought he was doing the Lord a favor by eliminating those that were followers of this fellow named Jesus, this individual who had been crucified, buried, and had had apparently risen from the dead. He wanted to eliminate this before it contaminated and destroyed the historic Jewish faith. Now, little did Saul know that on his way to Damascus, that the Lord would change him entirely and change his plan entirely. And and just like Saul of Tarsus, you know, we read throughout scripture of individuals who make plans and then the Lord comes about and changes those plans And in fact, on on Wednesdays, as we've been gathering with the men, we've been talking a lot about this, particularly in the life of Jacob um, in the book of Genesis. And if you remember, Jacob was always planning schemes and and just taking things into his own hands, matters into his own hands, and intervening even on the Lord's behalf. If you remember, for example, in the 27th and 28th chapter of Genesis, when, when Jacob left his homeland to Haran to flee from his brother Esau, he was trying to kill him. He desired to kill him because Jacob had deceitfully uh, stolen his blessing uh, from his father Isaac, a blessing that had been guaranteed to him since the womb, um, but he still did it deceitfully. Uh, what we see there is that him and his mother, Rebekah, had made this plan for him to run to Haran, to Laban, her brother, his uncle, and to, to be there just for a few days, which actually ended up being about 20 years, he ended up receiving two wives and having children and many other things. So that plan was a little bit different from what he initially um, had 
you know, anticipated. And then, of course, if you remember in the 31st and the 32nd chapter, in fact, we were talking about this on Wednesday, when the Lord led uh, Jacob back to um, his homeland from Haran, and he made his way back, uh, fleeing from Laban, his uncle, he had planned his, his move or his escape from Laban in a very deceitful way. Uh, despite the fact that the Lord had guided him and told him, hey, go back to your homeland, and he also guaranteed protection upon him. But he still did it in his own way. And of course, the Lord has to deal with him as he did before. And similarly, we as human beings, because we're in the flesh still, we make plans and we break plans, don't we? And if you look in Psalm chapter 2, often the Lord will laugh at our plans. And I know this is true, particularly in my life. Um, you know, I know a lot of you don't know my story completely, but before I moved back to El Paso, I actually used to live in Colorado for several years. Um, I had moved there from, from Texas, from, from Lubbock, Texas. I, I was born and raised here, but lived in Lubbock for a while. And um, I had a great plan for my life, a, a plan that, like Saul of Tarsus, it didn't involve the Lord at all. And for, for me, for several years, my life was all about um, academia, university. I, I wanted to advance the field of science and save the planet from climate change. That was my life. That's all I cared about. And it was all about the creation. It wasn't about um, the creator. And when I moved to Colorado from Texas, um, I had just finished school. It, uh, I went to Texas Tech. I got a degree there in geophysics. I wanted to be a petroleum geologist. And then my interest changed. I became interested in atmospheric science. I had my head in the ground, I guess, and now my head was in the clouds. So I went to Colorado. Um, the Lord had opened up an opportunity to get a master's degree and a PhD in atmospheric science. And, um, and I went up to, to Fort Collins, Colorado. And um, the Lord had more in store for me than, than just that. And my plan was once I was done with that, I, I wanted to be a professor or a research scientist. I wanted to work for Scripps Institute of Oceanography in San Diego or for the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee. That was my goal. That, those were my plans. But like I said, just like Saul of Tarsus, my plans didn't involve the Lord or advancing the kingdom. They only involved Isaac in advancing, advancing Isaac. And, and thankfully, those plans, they fell apart, but for the better because the Lord was there. The Lord met me in that place and he changed my life from a doctor of philosophy PhD to a praying heaven down PhD. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a little bit. But what we're going to see here in the next several verses is that Saul's plan, it changes too. In verses three through four, it says, as he, Saul, traveled and was nearing Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So what we see here is that Saul has this amazing encounter with the Lord. And if you look in Acts chapter 22, if you look there in the sixth verse, Paul's testimony there is referencing what's happening here in chapter 9. And here I'm going to call him Paul because if you remember after the 13th chapter, uh, the word of God refers to him by his Roman name of Paul and not his Jewish name of Saul. But in Acts chapter 22, verse 6, it says, As I was traveling and approaching Damascus about noon, an intense light from heaven suddenly flashed around me. So when he had this experience, it was right around the noon hour, okay? And if you think about the noon hour, you go outside, the sun is typically at the highest point in the sky. It has like the least amount of atmosphere to travel through, the, the sun's energy. So it's typically the brightest time of the day. And for him to be blinded by a light that was brighter than the sun, have you guys ever looked directly in the sun? Don't do that. But if you've ever looked directly in the sun, it, it's really bright. And here Saul or Paul, he receives this, this vision from the Lord, right? He's completely blinded by this encounter. And that's, that's I don't know, that's really cool to me that the Lord does whatever he needs to do. And as you could imagine, it was this very bright light. And then the Lord tells him, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And what we can learn from this is that when the church is persecuted, the Lord himself is being persecuted. And he takes it personally. And when we find ourselves in the midst of persecution, 
And by the way, I truly believe that in this country, we are not facing persecution. Um, we, we might want to be silenced, but we're not facing the persecution that our brothers and sisters in Christ are facing in China or in other parts of the world where they're being beheaded and killed for their faith. Now, the way things are going in this country, it wouldn't surprise me if this was a situation here in the future. But in the midst of persecution, we're not alone, right? The Lord tells us to be of good cheer because he has overcome the world, the tribulations, the persecution, all those difficulties that come with it. So we know for our brothers and sisters in Christ that are facing persecution that the Lord is certainly with them and he's the one being persecuted and he takes it personally, just like he, he is here with Saul of Tarsus. But then notice in verse 5 that Jesus identifies who he is. It says, who are you, Lord? Saul said. He's like, who are you? And then he says, I am Jesus, um, the one you are persecuting. Now, if you, if you look in the book of Acts chapter 26, so just a few chapters to the right there, um, Paul's testimonial account of this event, it mentions this where the Lord says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? But then he adds, or the Lord adds there, um, and, and Luke writes this for us. It says, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. So at this point, obviously, Saul of Tarsus realizes that the Lord is not dead. He's alive. And it says here that it, it kind of compares uh, Saul of Tarsus to maybe an oxen or a cattle or, you know, a goat or something, where it says it is hard for you to kick against the goats. So what we see here is this, this picture painted of Saul of Tarsus' um, behavior. And have you guys heard of a goat before? A goad before. So a goad is, is basically like a stick with a pointed edge. Um, I think now like they're, they have like, um, they can be electrically charged now and they're used to, to, um, uh, to drive cattle and oxen. Okay. So essentially the picture we see here is that Saul is like an ox and Jesus is, you know, the farmer and Saul is this dumb and stubborn ox. And yet he's very valuable and potentially extremely useful for the master. And Jesus is goading Saul in the right direction, um, and it's causing pain to him. And instead of going in the right direction, Saul, in a sense, is kicking against the goad and causing more pain for himself. And um, as a result of this, uh, you know, he, he is, uh, he's not submitting to the Lord. And in, in just a little bit, we're going to see that he actually does submit to the Lord. Now, the next thing we see is that the Lord gives Saul some very specific instructions. Uh, in verse 6, it says, But get up and go into the city. Okay, so this is Damascus. And you will be told what you must do. And certainly when God tells us to do something, we, we, we better do it, right? Um, if you look in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, verse 28, the Lord reminds us there that blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Right? The epistle of James, chapter 1, tells us to be doers of God's word and not just hearers of God's word. So when God tells us to do something, we better do it. And we're going to see here that he does actually do what the Lord calls him to do or tells him to do. Now in verse 7, 8, and 9, uh, this is interesting because there was men that were traveling with him. So Saul of Tarsus, he wasn't by himself. And, and there it says, the men who were traveling with him they stood speechless, hearing the sound, but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they took him by the hand and led him into Damascus. He was unable to see for three days and did not eat or drink. So this is very interesting. Here we see that Saul, he's lost his sight completely, um, and he has to be escorted into Damascus by these individuals that were traveling with him. And um, it says here that he fasted for three days. He didn't eat anything. And then we're also told that those that were traveling with him, they didn't see anybody or anyone, and they heard the sound, okay? And some scholars suggest that the Lord perhaps spoke to Saul of Tarsus in the Hebrew language that was primarily spoken by the scribes, the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, kind of like their religious elite. And the more common version of, of Hebrew, the Aramaic version, Aramaic version rather, that not so scholarly language was perhaps spoken by those individuals. 
So what they heard, they didn't understand, but it was understandable, um, or understood rather, by Rabbi Saul himself, but not the individuals that were with him. We don't know, I don't know how the Lord spoke to him, but all I know is that Saul understood, and the individuals, they just heard a sound. Um, but what we're going to see in the next several verses is that there's this dramatic change in his initial plans. And, um, and it's a beautiful thing because now we're going to see this terrorist turn into one of the most valuable individuals um, in the church and in church history. And, you know, as I shared with you guys just, uh, just a little moment ago, uh, you know, my initial plans for my life, they, they didn't involve the Lord. It was all, and, and everything that I went through, I know was part of his plan um, and, and for what he had in store for me and what he has in store for me. So in a sense, I needed to go through everything that I've gone through um, and wrestled through for the purposes of finding him. And I think for many of us in this room, maybe it can be said for you as well, everything that you've gone through in this life um, in Christ has not been wasted, right? And, you know, it's all part of your journey to find Christ and to finally be in Christ. And in fact, if you look in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says there, For you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath uh, before ordained that you should walk in them. You know, so God knows what he had in mind for your life. He knows what he had in mind for my life. God knows that ministry or that work that he had in mind for you um, to fulfill for the kingdom's sake. The only issue is we need to respond, right? The Lord has all that in place for us because the Lord doesn't need us. He desires to use us and we have to respond. And I know for me, um, when I had my head in the clouds in Colorado and I was, you know, trying to save the planet, um, the more I studied creation, the more I became inspired and in awe of the creator. And one of my favorite verses can be found in the book of Romans. There in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, it says, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. And that is so true. And as I said, the Lord changed my life from a doctor of philosophy PhD to a praying heaven down PhD. And I'm so grateful for that. And I think it was, it was a great um, immunologist or, or microbiologist. He said, I think it was Dr. Um, I think it was Dr. Heisenberg. He once said, the first gulp from the glass of natural sciences will turn you into an atheist, but at the bottom of the glass, God is waiting for you. And it's so true because I found him. I found him in his creation. And I'm so thankful for that because, because he's so good. And I love the Lord so much for that because he had so much more for me than just that. And I'm thankful for the brothers and the sisters in Christ that the Lord has brought into my life that he brought into my life then and he's brought into my life now and how he's used those individuals to shape me and to mold me. To mold me. You know, the pastors and the men that he brought alongside me to, to teach me and to disciple me, um, to goad me, if you will, in the right direction, um, to show me what it meant to serve and to love um, the Lord. And I'm so thankful for the people also that have been praying for me and continue to pray for me. And, um, you know, my mom used to always tell me, you, you can run from a lot of things, but you can't run from, from my prayers, you would say, but you, we can't run from people's prayers. Um, A.W. Pink once said, the measure of our love for others can largely be determined by the frequency and earnestness of our prayers for them. So just like so many people were praying for me, so many people were praying for you guys when you were still in the world. I bet there were a lot of people praying for Saul of Tarsus. Now, the word doesn't specifically say that, but I truly believe people were praying for him, praying that the Lord would change his heart. And when we pray, God will always answer those prayers in a way that we don't understand according, according to his will and according to his timing, which has never been my timing and has never been my will. Um, and I'm sure many of you can relate to that. But when we pray, the Lord will answer those prayers. And the hardest part about when we pray is just waiting on the Lord. And in fact, Pastor Angel talked a little bit about this in that third chapter of, of the book of Ruth. And, you know, we have to understand that the difficult part of our faith 
is waiting on the Lord. That's one of the most difficult things. Isaiah 55 verse 8 tells us, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. This is the Lord's uh, declaration. However, as we wait on the Lord, we can be content where the Lord has us in that moment in time, and we can rest in Him. And, you know, I love what Paul declares there in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, and the fact that he learned to be content in any circumstance that he himself uh, found himself in. And we know that the safest place to be is in God's perfect will. So we can't give up on the people that we've been praying for. Often we pray and then nothing happens and then we stop praying. Like when nothing happens, that's when you got to keep praying and keep praying and keep praying. And maybe you have a friend or a family member that doesn't know the Lord and you've been praying for them and nothing has happened yet. Or maybe a family member who's gone astray and you want them to come back. Keep praying for them. Keep fighting for them. And, um, and the Lord will do what he desires to do. And in the meantime, you can be content where the Lord has you in the moment because you know that the Lord is still on the throne and in control of that entire circumstance. He'll do what he needs to do um, in his timing. And as I mentioned before, all I wanted to do was advance the field of science. And the planet, I wanted to save it from climate change. And now in the Lord, all I want to do is be a part of advancing the kingdom and um, pointing people to Jesus so that they can be saved from eternal damnation. And I can tell you, once you taste and you see the goodness of the Lord, um, there's absolutely um, no turning back. And the, God, the Lord is so good. God is so good. I love what um, uh, Raven Hill says regarding this. He says, the greatest miracle in the world is how God can take an unholy man out of an unholy world Make him holy, put him back in that unholy world, and he can walk in truth and righteousness from here to eternity, even if he walks through hell. And God's so good, and I'm so thankful for that. And now that Saul, you know, he's been immobilized, if you want to call it that, maybe even humiliated by the Lord. Um, now God has his full attention, and now Saul is dependent on the Lord. And he can finally do what he desires to do with Saul's life. And, and once again, we've been talking about this in the life of Jacob. They're in the book of Genesis on Wednesdays. If you remember, Jacob, once, once again, he was on his way back to his homeland from Haran. And he was planning to meet his brother Esau. And if you remember, um, Esau wanted to kill him. And, and, and Jacob, in his own way... He planned to meet Esau, right? He planned this in his own way. He made his plans for this meeting in accordance to his own will and in accordance to his own power. And, um, and because of this, we see in the process that he ends up wrestling with the Lord. And the truth of the matter is the real enemy that Jacob was facing was not outside of him. It wasn't Esau. It was actually within. It was his own carnal fleshly nature that needed to be conquered. And the thing is, we can't conquer anything in this life until the Lord has conquered us. And just like Jacob, Saul too had to be conquered by God so that God could use him and do what he does, desired to do with him. God had to conquer me so he could do what he desired to do with me. God had to conquer all of us in this room to do what he desires to do with us. Even though often we, we have to get, you know, goaded in the right direction because we're sheep and we're dumb and we go this way and we go that way. You know, the Lord's patient and he, he, um, he's long-suffering towards us. And I love that because I'm a personally, I'm a very difficult person and the Lord is very patient with me. But just as God had a new plan for Jacob, he also had a new plan for Saul. And we're going to see what this plan looks like in the next several verses. So if you look here in verse 10, and I'll go ahead and read through verse uh, 17, it says, there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, here I am, Lord, he replied. Get up and go to the street called Straight. The Lord said to him, to the house of Judas, and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. Since he is praying there, in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and placing his hands on him so that he may regain his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard from many people about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has authority here from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, 
Go, for this man is my chosen instrument to take my name to Gentiles, to kings and Israelites. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Ananias went and entered the house. He placed his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road you were traveling has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. All right, so here we have another interesting event taking place. We have an individual named Ananias, a disciple of the Lord. And the Lord tells him, hey, go help this guy, Saul of Tarsus. Go help this terrorist, right, who's terrorizing the early church. And I think the connection we can make, that, make with this is like if the Lord told you, told you, hey, go help this person. By the way, they're a part of ISIS or they're a part of a, a, a group that's trying to, to kill you. Um, you would be maybe confused and maybe stressed out. I don't know. I would be really stressed out. I'd be like, are you sure? Um, and that's exactly what Ananias, do, Ananias does. He, he questions the Lord, probably out of fear, right? He says, Lord, I've heard about this man, right? He's causing much harm to those that are, um, that are your followers. And then the Lord tells him, hey, Saul is a chosen vessel, right? So Saul had been chosen to be used by the Lord. And, and now Ananias um, had to go do this. Now, Ananias, I what I love about this individual is he, um, he's obedient. He doesn't do like what Jonah tried to do, right? And we were talking about this, how the Lord had called Jonah to preach repentance to the, the Ninevites, these wicked, warlike people that were enemies of the children of Israel. And instead, he, he decides, hey, these people deserve judgment, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Tarshish instead. Um, but then ultimately, he ends up... Uh, going where, he des where the Lord had intention intended him to go. Of course, this time he ended up getting there in the, in the belly of a, a really large fish, as opposed to getting there in a more, I don't know, civilized way, if you want to call it. Um, but the Lord's will was done. And I love, once again, Ananias' obedience here. It's not just like fair-weather obedience that we need to have. We have to be obedient even when things don't make sense and are confusing to us, are unreasonable, because once again, God's ways are not our ways. And, um, and we, we can't question his ways. We have to abide to his ways. Now, notice here that um, Ananias calls Saul Brother Saul. And, and that's amazing because what we see here, this is an indication that he's now part of the way, the, the very group that he was trying to eliminate. And, and God's transforming power can be seen here, seen here because Lord, the Lord is able, you know, kind of like what he, t he tells Mary there in, um, in the Gospel of Luke, remember when the angel Gabriel told her that with God, nothing would be impossible. And we see this transformation here. And then notice here that when Ananias um, lays his hands on, on Saul of Tarsus, verse 18 tells us that immediately there, there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So what we see here is that Saul, you know, he had lost his physical, um, his physical sight. And what we see here is that as he gains his sight again, he loses his physical and spiritual blindness is what he loses. And then he regains his spiritual sight. And it kind of reminds me of what we read in the Gospel of Mark there in the eighth chapter. So Mark chapter eight, verse 25. And in fact, this is the very verse behind the name of our church. Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. And, you know, Pastor Angel can, can tell you more about this particular verse that the Lord had given him and, and how the Lord had called him to plant this church back in June of 2016. But if you remember there in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verse 25, you know, the Lord was there in the midst of his earthly ministry, and he was there at Bethsaida. And a blind man, a blind man rather, was brought to him, and he begged him to touch him. And if you remember, the Lord lays hands on him, um, he spit in his eyes, and then the man was able to see what looked like trees that were moving around or walking around. And then the Lord places his hands on him again for a second time. And it says there, Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes. The man looked intently and his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. And certainly in Christ Jesus, we see the world and we see everything in a completely different way, in a new way. We have a fresh vision of what we are supposed to see because we lose our spiritual 
and physical blindness and gain our spiritual sight. And God's so good. And unfortunately, sometimes he has to get us into that circumstance, just like Saul, in order for us to see things in the way we should be seeing things. But if you notice here in verse 19 and 20, it says, After taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul was with the disciples in Damascus for some time. Immediately he began proclaiming Jesus in the synagogues. He is the Son of God. That's amazing. So, you know, now Saul of Tarsus, he's there in Damascus. He's with the disciples um, of the Lord. And it says here that it, he spent some time with them. And you could imagine that time he spent with the disciples. He probably got a little bit more oriented with Christianity. Um, and then he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues is what the word of God says here. And this is amazing because now he saw everything in light of the cross. The, the Lord had opened up his heart his heart was open to Jesus and his heart was opened um, to the enlightenment by the Lord. And then what we're going to see in the next few verses is uh, what this actually does. And if you look in verse 21 through 25, it says, All who heard him were astounded and said, Isn't this the man in Jerusalem who was causing havoc for those who called on this name? Speaking of Jesus and came here for the purpose of taking them as prisoners to the chief priests. But Saul grew stronger and kept confounding the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had passed, the Jews conspired to kill him. But Saul learned of their plot. So they were watching the gates day and night, intending to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and lowered him in a large basket through an opening in the wall. And this is so cool because what we see here is that Paul grew in the Lord to the point where he confounded these unbelieving Jews, proving that Jesus was the Messiah, right? Being able to explain this messianic connection between the Old Testament and Jesus. And that, that's pretty cool um, to the point where these Jews in Damascus, they were not able to argue um, with Saul. And what we see once again is the significant change in his life, going from being a terrorist, a persecutor of the Lord and the early church to a follower and a preacher of Jesus Christ. Now he himself was the one being persecuted. And he now became an enemy, right, of these unbelieving Jews um, in, in Damascus. And what he had come initially to do was to help them um, with their struggle against that growing Christian movement there in Damascus. And now Saul of Tarsus actually became a part of that, um, of that so-called problem. And now they wanted to kill him. And what's interesting is, on his way to Damascus, he was going as this terrorist, you know, with a lot of vigor and, and um, machoism, I guess. And then he leaves that city as a humble servant, serving the Lord in a basket through a hole in the city wall. And that is a beautiful transformation, a transformed life, right? That's what repentance looks like. Um, and of course, as believers, we know that repentance is not just like this one-time thing. Like it's this continuous thing because we're not going to be perfect on this side of heaven, and the Lord has to continuously work on us. And, you know, Saul, in a sense, now had to leave everything that he knew in this new life in Christ. And, you know, we were talking a little bit about this uh, before, and, you know, when we give our lives to Jesus Christ, there's always going to be a cost, right? And what I mean by that is that when we come to the Lord, often it means leaving sins and habits that we used to be so comfortable with, things that used to give us pleasure and joy, even people that we used to associate with. Sometimes we have to leave all those things behind and it can be painful. It can be hard. And I love what Paul tells us in Philippians 3 verse 8. He says there, yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. So, you know, coming to Jesus Christ can be a difficult thing because it involves repentance, it involves a change, it involves a change in your life, and that, that can be hard. We don't like change. 
especially change that brings us that temporary pleasure that we keep going back to. Um, but all those things are, can be counted as loss, but at the same time, we gain uh, the Lord. So what we see here is this beautiful change in, this, in the life of Saul of, of Tarsus, right? And this change in his life and in our lives is only possible because of what Jesus did on the cross. And the fact that we've put our faith, we've placed our faith on that message of the cross or that gospel message, right? Number one, that Jesus died for our sins. Number two, that Jesus was buried. And number three, that Jesus rose from the dead three days later. When we wholeheartedly put our faith in that message, there's that element of repentance in our lives that is ongoing until we leave this planet. The book of Romans tells us in chapter 3, verse 22 through 24, it says, The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And sometimes we don't think God can change certain people. Well, He changed you. He changed me, right? So He's able to change anybody. And it reminds me of, of, of uh, what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. And I love this because there um, he's dealing with this difficult church body there in the church in Corinth, very carnal Christians, right? Coming out of this, um, this pagan society that was so accustomed to the wisdom of the world and, um, and unholiness. And there he tells them in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. He says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, uh, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And God is so good. That is transformation power that's only possible because of what Jesus did on the cross. And, and God is so good. And that's why this morning we, sh- we, we need to be so grateful and so thankful for the message and for the cross. So in closing this morning, there are several things I want us to remember. Okay, as we walk with the Lord with this heart of thanksgiving, we always want to be abiding in the Lord. And remember, the Lord has called each and every single one of us to make disciples of every nation and to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. Now, we're all going to do that in a different way, right? We all have gifts and talents that the Lord has given to us. But in order for us to accomplish this and to remain steadfast in the Lord, we must be, number one, in prayer, right? This is our dialogue with the Lord. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5 tells us to pray without ceasing, And I love what Corey Ten Boom says regarding prayer. She once described it like this. The wonderful thing about praying is that you leave a world of not being able to do something and enter God's realm where everything um, is possible. Secondly, we have the word of God. Okay. And this is how the Lord speaks to us because he is the word, right? You look in the book of John chapter one, verse one, it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And God was the word, or the word was God. And then in verse 14, the word became flesh, speaking of Jesus, and dwelt or tabernacled among us. So God is the word. He's speaking to us through his word. And that's why we have to get into our Bibles and study his word and be the Bereans and and just um, be so intimate with his word and know it. And and that'll help us in our walk. Uh, Thirdly, we, we need to be filled and led by the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. Just as Jesus was filled by the power and the person of the Holy Spirit when he was led into the wilderness. And because of this, he was able to escape the tactics of the enemy. And you can look at that in the Gospel of Luke chapter 4. And then lastly, we need fellowship. And, you know, we've been talking a lot about this in in the men's group and we talk about this in the youth group. But we need each other. Like, we can't run this race by ourselves. This isn't something you can do solo. We need each other. And if you want godly counsel for your life, you're you're not going to get it on the world. You're not going to get it from the world or or from from anything else that's not um, in fellowship with the Lord. Proverbs 15, 22 tells us, without counsel, plans go awry, 
but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. And, you know, God has done a great transformation power in our lives, and we must continue to walk in that victory with a heart of thanksgiving. You know, Pastor Chuck once said, God often goes to the gutter to find the recipient for his grace. He lifts him out, washes him, and transforms him, making him into a child of God, fit for his kingdom. That is God's grace. And, you know, this week as we reflect on what the Lord has done in our lives, um, let us always be thankful for the cross and that transforming power that the gospel has. The gospel is so powerful. You know, sometimes we, we don't understand that. The, the, the gospel is transforming. And we read about this, for example, this morning in the, in the life of Saul of Tarsus. And we've experienced it in our own lives. So as we continue to experience the transforming power of the gospel in the cross this week, let us continue to be, um, to be thankful. Amen? So if you're here in person or maybe you're watching on the live stream and maybe you don't have a relationship with, um, with Jesus Christ, we want to give you that opportunity this morning. And, and maybe you're in a situation where you don't have any hope. You don't have any, anything to look forward to, anything to live for. That's how you feel. We want to give you the opportunity to have a loving father who will guide you and will lead you uh, for the rest of your life and for all eternity. And um, if, it, if that's you this morning, I, I want to invite you to, to close your eyes and bow your head and you can repeat this prayer after me. But you need to repeat this with all of your heart. Uh, Jesus Christ, I want to declare you as my Lord and Savior this morning. Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you were buried. And I believe that you rose from the dead three days later. I also recognize that I am a sinner. Please forgive me of my sins and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Transform me and shape me and use me um, for your glory. Amen. Now, if you prayed that this morning, we want to thank you for doing that. And I assure you that there are angels celebrating on your behalf in heaven this morning. And um, if you maybe have some questions about your next step, maybe you need a Bible, you need to connect with a small group or with a church, um, I invite you to, to call us, to reach out to us, or you can come visit us. We meet on Sunday mornings at, um, at 10 a.m. And um, we, we thank you so much for taking the time this morning to come here and to worship the Lord with us. We pray that you have a beautiful Thanksgiving, and, um, and we love you. We hope to see you again uh, very soon here.